The two sermons that Dr. Tozer refers to on this cassette as having previously preached are unfortunately unavailable. Tonight I want to read that text again. We've read it, you know, variously. I've read it, and we've read it responsibly, and we've read it variously. Now, I want to read it from a translation that you, that you may never have heard of, and certainly most of you have never seen. It is a translation directly out of the Aramaic, not out of the Greek, but out of the Aramaic of the Eastern Church, the language Jesus spoke, and the language Paul spoke originally. I'll just read the same. It's uh, Philippians 3, 7 to 15. Not much difference, but a little, and uh, we're sticking by the King James, of course. But I thought you'd like to hear this. But these things, says Paul, which once were again to me, I counted a loss for the sake of Christ, and I still count them all lost, for the sake of the abundant knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord, by whom I have lost everything. And I have considered all those things as refuge, so that I may increase in Christ and be found in him, since I have no righteousness of my own gained from the law. But the righteousness which comes through the faith of Christ, that is, the righteousness which comes from God, so that through this righteousness I may know Jesus and the power of his resurrection and be a partaker of his suffering, even to a death like his, that I may by any means attain the resurrection from the dead, not as though I had already attained or already perfect, but I am striving that I may reach that for which Jesus Christ appointed me. My brother, I do not consider that I have reached the goal, but this one thing I do know, Forgetting those things which are behind me, I strive for those things which are before me. I press toward the goal to receive the prize of victory of God's highest calling through Jesus Christ. Then he gets a breath and says, Therefore, let those of you who are perfect, this got through saying weren't, uh, therefore let those of you who are perfect think these things over. That's why we're meeting these Sunday nights. And this reason, if you reason any other way, that if you've got any other ideas about this, why like God will be leaving this to That I'm right about it, and if you don't see the way I do, I said God will show you all right. Now, I've given you two mottos. I want to give you a third one tonight. You know that we're allowing an old... A 600-year-old book to help us along the way called The Cloud of Unknowing. And we're basing our teaching on the New Testament, and then we're allowing this old brother to help us a little along the way. And I gave you, have given you already, two mottos. They are, look now forward and let be backwards. You got that one. Last week I gave you a second one. You will that do but look on him and let him alone. I give you the third one tonight. He is a jealous lover, and he suffers no rival. Now, I have said that there are four identifiable stages that a man might find twenty-four. There is a common Christian about which I have preached already, <clears throat> and I'm still talking about the special Christian. I talked about that last week. And we'll move on in the weeks to come into what we call a singular Christian. And then there is the Christian who has moved up into God until he has begun to be perfect, though so it is said both by Paul and by the old writer that we may begin in this life a life of perfection, but never attain fully to it till we attain it in the bliss of heaven. Now, uh, Paul is our example, and Paul said in the text, that I may know him. And the word know there means acquaint or acquaintance, and it means experience. It means these two things, to be acquainted with and experience. You may be acquainted with a man, 
and yet not have experienced the man in any sense at all. If I introduce you, for instance, to my friend, old almost lifelong friend, Reverend Miller here tonight, uh, you could say, yes, I'm acquainted with him. But you have not experienced him in the sense that I have, running around with him, traveling with him in his car, usually, and uh, preaching with him and uh, going with him here and there and talking with him endless numbers of times and praying with him. There's a difference between acquaintance and experience. To get acquainted with God is one thing, but to go on to experience God in intensity and richness of acquaintance is something more. And Paul said, I want to know him in that depth and the rich intensity of his spirit. Because, you see, as I have said many times, personality can't be fully known at one encounter. You may need a person you don't particularly like at first. But after you get to know them, you get to liking them because you find the hidden uh, potentialities in their personality that you didn't know was there. Now, Christ is capable of increasing intimacy of the Christians. And if I have anything to say to the Church of Christ and to the Alliance and to the evangelicals in the world, it is this, that our great weakness is that we not only are not going on to know Christ in rich intimacy of acquaintance, but we're not even talking about it. We don't even hear about it. It doesn't get into our magazines. It doesn't get into our books. It doesn't get onto our radios. It's not found in our churches. This yearning, this longing to know him in increasing measure. Now, we may enjoy this increasing acquaintance with that. I want you to hear me say that. And you say that Jesus Christ is a uh, he, a person. Why do you call him that? Now, you may not understand me now. But as Paul says, if you think otherwise, God will reveal even that unto you. Before we can know God as a he or him, we know God as a that. I think that every theologian would agree with me on that. And I find back here in the book of John these words, first of all, before I read them, remember what was said to the Virgin Mary? That holy thing which is born of thee shall become called the Son of God. That holy thing which is born of thee. And now, John, not an amateur theologian, <clears throat> but the man who had laid his head upon the breast of Jesus, begins his wondrous first epistle with the word that, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. Personality is not found there yet. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. It's not until the last two lines of the third stanza that he put personality in there. It's that before. Now, remember, my friend, that uh, Jesus Christ, while he is person, and you know that, I, we all agree that he's the person, he's the son, the eternal son, he is also that which is the source of everything. He is that which is the foundation and fountain of everything you and I are created to enjoy. He is the fountain of all truth, but he is more, he is truth itself. He is the source and spring of all beauty, but he is more, he is beauty itself. 
He is the fountain of all wisdom, but he is more. He is wisdom itself, and in him are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge hidden away. He is the fountain of all grace. He is the fountain and source of all life, but he is more than that. He said that I am the bread of life, and I am the life. He is the fountain of love, but he is more than that. He is love. He is resurrection, and he is immortality, and he is, as the song says, brightness of the Father's glory, sunshine of the Father's face. You know, we try to discover what gets wrong with us when we start to backslide in groups and denominations and churches and individuals. And I believe that our Lord Jesus hit on the head of it when he said, You have left your first degree of love. Not your first love consecutively in the sense that there's love number one and love number two and love number three. But he said you've left your first degree of love. And what I'm preaching to try to bring about in the Church of Jesus Christ is a rediscovery of the loveliness of the Savior, that we might begin to love him again with an intensity of love such as our fathers knew. I have said before, and I repeat it now, that the power and greatness of A.B. Simpson was not in his theology, for he positively was not a great theologian compared, for instance, with Calvin or some of the other theologians. The power and greatness of the man lay in his unquenchable love for the person of Jesus Christ the Lord. There's a song we sing, and I want to read two verses, there's a few stanzas that we don't even know about. The first one says, Fairest Lord Jesus, ruler of all nature, O thou of God and man the Son, thee will I cherish, thee will I honor, thou my soul's glory, joy, and crown. We know those, that one and two others, but there are others that we don't get, and here's one. It says, Fair are the flowers, fair are our children, when viewed in this unclouded day. Yet they must perish, all will soon vanish, Jesus alone abides for us. Gaze out upon the world, on your family, your friends, your loved ones, all the little lovely beauty of children and young people viewed in earth's unclouded day. Yet candor and realism compels, compel us to say, yet they must perish, all will soon vanish. And when they have vanished, we have only Jesus who alone abides for a Earth's fairest beauty, heaven's brightest splendor, in Jesus Christ unfolded see. All that here shineth quickly declineth before his spotless purity. There are those who would trouble you because you can't be all, get all steamed up about things. Uh, a friend of mine was uh, quite hurt because uh, I just, I just can't get all excited and steamed up about earthly things. I can't possibly do it. I can't possibly stand off and uh, strike an attitude of all oh, at a four porthole Buick or a Cadillac, or something else. I can't. And uh, the houses they're building that are supposed to be so magnificent. Remember that when you have seen the house or the city that has foundations whose builder and maker is God, you can't get excited about any house ever any man in this world ever built. You can't get excited about it. Somebody said that Abraham saw the city that had foundations whose builder and maker was God, and he wouldn't build a house after that. He said, I'll never try to imitate it. I'll live in the tent till I get my house up there. It was so beautiful. Well, earth's fairest beauty and heaven's brightest splendor is all unfolded in Jesus Christ. And all that here shineth quickly declineth before his spotless purity. That's what one man said about Jesus. Now I want to tell you that it costs to know Jesus Christ like that. 
Because the most people won't pay the price for it at all. That's why most Christians are common. They won't go on because, for Christ's sake, they have surrendered evil things. Uh, that is, things that are injurious and things that are unclean and grossly sinful. Everywhere in fundamentalism we have given up the grossly sinful things, and we have all agreed on what those grossly sinful things are. We shudder at the thought of the honky song, though there are some churches and tabernacles that you couldn't tell the difference if somebody didn't yell Jesus occasionally to give it a holy atmosphere. But uh, a honky tonk and unholy places, we stay out of them, and uh, there are certain things we don't do, and for Christ's sake, we have surrendered those evil things. But this is the mark of a common Christian, and the man who's never gone beyond that is a mediocre Christian. Paul surrendered the good along with the bad. And he said, not only the things that are bad have I given up, but he said, what things were gained to me, those I counted lost. The things that he had a right to, the things that were gained to him, and that he had every legal and moral right to lay hold of and say, this is mine and Christianity is not going to take it from me. He said, I've given up even that, because I've seen something so much better. It is that which was with the Father. It is that source, that, 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 that fountain from which flows all wisdom and beauty and truth and immortality. So for the sake of that, I have given it all up. He knew, Paul did, that the human heart was idolatrous, and it will worship anything that it possesses. Anything that you get your hand on, you will worship. As a little child who takes his teddy bear to bed with him, so we grown up have our teddy bears too. We were too grown up and mature, you know, to be caught taking a teddy bear or doll to bed. But we have what must look to God like teddy bears and dolls. We hang on to them. A baby, of course, has a right to that. I believe in that. We kept teddy bears floating around for years at home until they got droopy, and they were pretty old when they did. But, uh, the, the point I'm making is that we oldsters, we, we mature people, people even in their teens, uh, when we still insist upon hanging on to things, whatever you hang on to, you worship. Don't forget that, because it gets between you and God, whether it be property or family or reputation or security or your life itself. And Jesus taught us that we couldn't even hang on to our life itself. That if we made our living on earth to be something that we wouldn't give up and hung to, it would get in our way and we'd lose ourselves at last. He taught that. Taught it plainly. And then this grasping after security. Always. We want to be secure. Well, Paul wasn't secure. He said he died dead. And he was out on the bosom of the sea for three weeks, night and day, and he was always in difficulty. This, this longing for security. I want, I want security in this life and eternal security in the world above. And there we have it, that's fundamentalism. Security here and eternal security there. Brethren, Paul said, I give it all up. I disavow and disown everything. Now, there are certain things God let him have. He let him have a book or two. He let him have a garment, a cloak. He let him have uh, his own hired house for two years in one instance. And he let him have some things. But Paul never allowed them to touch his heart. Any external treasure that touches your heart is a curse. And Paul said, I give that up that I might know him that I might go on to deeply enrich and increasing intimacy and vast expanses of knowledge of the one who is infinite and illimitable in his beauty, and I go on to know him, and that I might know him, I give all this up. And he never allowed anything to touch his heart. You see, friends, we have been taught over the last years 
in our Christian circles that Christ is something added on to a happy, jolly, really rather clean, but worldly and earthly life to save us from hell and to get us into the mansions over there. But that's not New Testament way of looking at things. It's not the way Paul looked at it at all. Paul looked at it as that Jesus Christ was so infinitely attractive that he didn't count anything at all to amount to anything. Paul was a learned man, a learned at the feet of Gamaliel. He had what they'd call now Ph.D. Paul was a learned man, but Paul said, that's all wrong. He said, he used an ugly word about it, a, a garbage. He said, it's no good. I put it all behind me. And he said, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin, and I'm circumcised the eighth day, and I belong to the fathers. And I've got the marks upon me, and my name's in the register, and I can show you who I am. But he said, for the sake of Jesus Christ, I count that nothing at all. I put that under my feet. Some of you are proud of your Dutch blood, and that's why you're half carnal all the time. Some of you are proud of your Swedish blood, and that's why you're carnal all the time. And some of you are proud of some other blood. All blood's the same kind of blood, corrupt blood. And I don't care whether it comes from the royalty or from the gutter, it's, or it's corrupt blood. But we're proud of things and proud of what we can do. Paul said, everything, the proudest thing I have, the thing of which I am the proudest, I count it but lost. But modern Christianity says, stop gambling or the bomb will get you. Stop drinking or you'll go down like Rome. Stop this or that, and you pick out those ugly, bestial things that nobody wants to do if they're in their right mind, and that's all the sins there are. Paul said, I quit those so long ago. He never even did them. He didn't even do them. He was a Jew in all good conscience, and he didn't have to quit them. And that's why I sometimes uh, feel like smiling kind of sourly when I hear a big testimony about somebody that drank and then he got saved and quit it. Now, sure, you'll get saved and quit it, but that ought to be elementary. That ought to be way back down the years. The man who writes a book on how bad he was, you can have the book. I already have books I won't read. Well, friends, uh, now let, let this old man talk to us a little bit here. He says, but one thing I tell thee, he, that is God, he's a jealous lover and he suffers no rival. Now, brethren, that's what's the matter with us. We're allowing rivals to come up. No, no, de no decent fella, uh, nobody that has any, any uh, self-respect uh, is going to suffer a rival, but uh, he says God won't suffer a rival. And he says here in this old English, which I'll translate into bad modern English, he says, And to him let not work in thy will, but he only would be by himself. He says that God won't work in your will, but unless he can only be there by himself. We have too many gods. We have too many irons in the fire. And we have too much theology that we don't understand, and we have too much religion, and too much churchanity, and too much institutionalism, and, and uh, too much of too much, and the result is God isn't in there by himself. He says, if I'm not in your heart by myself, I will work. He says, remember that now, him let's not work in thy will, but he only lets he's there by himself. And when Jesus Christ has everything cleansed from the temple and dwells there alone, he will work. And old Fenelon talks about him where here God's working like a miner in the depths of the earth. Have you ever been in a coal mine? Way deep down in the earth, they're mining out coal or gold or diamonds. And anybody can fly overhead or walk overhead or travel by and never dream what's going on in the depths of the hill yonder. Never know. That way in that hill unseen, there is an intelligence force at work bringing out gold. And so said Fenelon that that's what God does in the human breast. He works hidden and unseen within the breast. But we're dramatic in our day. We don't want God to work unless he comes with a beard on and a, and a staff uh, playing a part. We want him to be theatrical and... and, and uh, 
do the thing, you know, with uh, a good deal uh, of color and pyrotechnics, which means fireworks in uh, English. And we, God won't work like that. God says, no, no, no. You, you children of Adam, you children of carnality and lust, you who love a fair show in the flesh, you, you who have been brought up wrong and have wrong ideas about night's time, uh, I won't work. I won't work in you. Jesus said, I can't do it. I'm sorry. I can't work in you, in your will nor in your heart, unless I can be there alone. But some of you need to do is cleanse the temple. You just need to get busy and throw out, drive out the cattle and upset the money changers and shovel out the dirt and, and get rid of a lot of things that are rivaling the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the motto, he's a jealous lover and he suffereth no rival. And he goes on and he says this, lift up thine heart now unto God. With a meek stirring of love and mean himself and none of these goods. And there too look be loaf. I look that word loaf up in the unabridged and it's an old Anglo Saxon word meaning um, unwilling, be unwilling. Uh hate and be unwilling to think on aught but God himself. So that nothing works in your wit nor in your will, that's in your head nor in your heart, but only himself. Now again we're back to where we were started. When I said that himself, when I said that Simpson in the early days talked about himself, and he shocked and blessed the generation because he talked about himself. He said, Jesus himself, is he, it's himself that we need. I suppose you know how himself came to be written, I'm sure somebody, if not I told you, about how Dr. Simpson went over to England, to London, to a Bible conference, and there were three sermons on sanctification. And uh, he preached the last one. That's a bad spot to be in. But the first fellow got up and said that the way to be holy and victorious in your heart was to suppress the old man. He taught suppression. Another man got up and taught eradication. And he said deliverance from the old uh, carnal life is by eradication. Get rid of the old man, pull him up, turn him up to the roots, up to the sun, and to die. And Dr. Simpson had to get in between there, so he got up and he took one word for his text, in his text. And he gave his testimony about how he had tried to get the victory. And he said, sometimes I would get it and think I had it, and then I'd lose it. And then he said, when I came to the knowledge that victory, sanctification, deliverance, purity, holiness, all is himself. And he said, after that was easy and the glory came to my life. I thought that was a beautiful piece of diplomacy. I also thought that it was the most wonderfully wise way to handle a thing in good theology. And then around that he wrote his famous hymn, Once it was a blessing, now it is the Lord. Once uh, his gift I wanted, now the giver own. Uh, now himself alone. Now, uh, there's got to be more of himself these days. You know, Christianity has gotten to be, I've said this before, and I'm summing it up tonight, it has gotten to be a way of getting things from God. A, a way of, uh, we give a tithe in order that our nine-tenths will go further than our ten-tenths. And I claim that any businessman who wouldn't would be a jackass with long hair years. A man who would find out that by giving God one-tenth, his nine-tenths went further than his ten-tenths had, ordinary business would lead you to do that, wouldn't it? Sure it would. A man that wouldn't do that, that's not spirituality, that's his means. <laughs> and if a man wants, if a man wants to be uh, a businessman and uh, use God, why, uh, okay. But uh, that's not that's not what the Bible teaches, and that's not what Paul talked about. Paul had given up that years before. That's not what the old writer of the cloud of unknowing talked about. He said it's only himself. And he said, now do thou that in the years to forget all the creatures that ever God made, so that thy thoughts nor thy desires be not directed nor stretched to any of them, but let them be and take no heed of them. So that... Uh, Christian businessmen are in danger. Now, I, I talked to Christian businessmen, committee men, and 
They, they want me to come and beg me to come just to say this to them. I'm not condemning my good friends of the Christian Businessmen Committee or my good and loved friend who edits their magazine back here, Dave Enlow, but I say Christian businessmen can get to a spot where they make Christianity to be a way to have a prosperous business down here in a mansion in the sky. Either way you win. If you follow the Lord, you'll prosper down here. Brethren, to follow the Lord doesn't always mean, in fact, I would say it rarely means to have financial prosperity. But following the Lord has meant down the years to count those things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. And where a fellow prospers in spite of himself, by then the way he gets around it, he gives everything away, as much as he can at least. He keeps enough to live on, thank God he's still here, body and soul held together, and the place to live, and we try to take him to church and to work. But further than that, he's not much concerned. But we have made Christianity to be a way, a technique, by which we can get things. Paul didn't, he knew better than that. He said, yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. I have suffered the loss of all things, and I do count them but dung that I may win Christ, and that I may know him through the power of his resurrection. Now it's himself. He said, let them be and take no heed to them. That's why, that's why, somebody, that's why you can't get anywhere. And that's why some of you are going to stop coming to hear me preach this series, because we're getting around close where you live, before we went so near to you. But they uh, beginning to stick the needle in a little, and you just don't want that. You'd like to have a deeper life that cat could be given to you with a syringe, or that could be given to you with a glass of water and then and a pill. Said to take one pill three times a day, and the fellow said, you just can't do that. But uh, some people, uh, that, that's, that's the way they get their, their, their religion. They want it in pill form. And they buy books to get it in pill form. Rather in there isn't any such a thing. There's a cross, there's a gallus, there's a man with stripes on his back, there's an apostle with no property, there, there's a tradition of loneliness and weariness and rejection and glory, but there are no pills. But some want to pill. But I say himself, himself, himself. Well, friends, I don't know. I wish. Yet I don't wish. I don't wish anything. I pray for it, and if it isn't God's will, why I don't want it, and if it is God's will, why I don't wish a pray. But I'd like to see somewhere a recapture once more before I die of the glory that men knew of the beauty of Jesus. One old brother said this about him, many dubious names thou bearest, and I might say that as you students know, but the average person wouldn't have any reason to know, Ishai, I-S-H-I is the word for husband in the Hebrew. And so he wrote a poem about Jesus. This old brother, and he said, Many beauteous names thou bearest, Brother, shepherd, friend, and king, But they none unto my spirit Such divine support can bring. Ishai, Ishai is the jewel, Mine he is while ages roll, Angels taste not of such glory, Holy Ishai of the soul. Other joys are short and fleeting, thou and I can never part. Thou art altogether lovely, Ishai, Ishai of my heart. They sang that once. Where could you sing that now? Well, I think we could sing it here, brother. But there aren't many places where you can sing it because people don't have the experience that it conveys, you see, that it embodies. Whenever a song is rejected, it's rejected as a rule, it's a good song, because the people don't understand it and they find it dull. If you like rock and roll, you won't like Ishai. And if you like tender lady watches over me, you won't like Ishai. And if you like he, you won't like Ishai. Ishai is the jewel, mine he is while ages roll. Angels taste not of such glory, holy Ishai of the soul. 
And this is the teaching of the deeper light. It is to put away all the creatures that ever God made and stop trying to promote your family. Stop trying to promote your business and use God to do it. Stop trying to promote anything and use God to do it. And put everything away but God, for he lists not work in my heart unless he can be there alone. Put everything else out. Some young preacher will study until you have to get thick glasses, take care of his failing eyesight, because he has an idea he wants to become a famous preacher. And he wants to use Jesus Christ to make him a famous preacher. He's just a huckster buying and selling and getting gain. They'll ordain him and he'll be known as Reverend. And if he writes a book, they'll make him a doctor. And uh, he'll be known as doctor, but he's still a huckster, buying and selling and getting gain. And if the Lord comes back, he'll drive him out of the temple along with the other cattle. But uh, we can use the Lord for anything, or try to use him. But what I'm preaching to you, and what Paul taught here, and what was picked up by the centuries, and brought down the years, and what gave birth to the missionary society that you and I know about and belong to, was just exactly the other thing. Oh, God, we don't want anything you have, we want thee. That's the cry of the soul on its way up. That's the cry of the soul. In England, they say, there is a bird called a skylark. We don't have them here. The nearest thing we have to it here that does the same thing is the, what they call the wild canary, the American goldfinch. But it's a poor little weak example of the skylark. So they say the skylark will mount and mount and sing as it mounts. And the poet that talked about it said that the skylark mounts and sings hymns at heaven gates. And it mounts until it's out of sight, they say. And they can still hear the song coming down while they can no longer see the bird. Mounting and singing as it rises. My friends, this is what I'm preaching about. But this is what most people don't want. I think most of you must or you wouldn't be here because you knew what I was going to preach on. Another thing a man said about him was this that I've always loved to quote. Love sits on his eyelids and scatters delight through all the wide regions above. Their faces, the cherubim, veil in his sight and tremble with raptures of love. These people who have to have whole truckloads of gadgets to get their religion going, what do they do when they don't have anything like that? They're, the truck can't get where they're going. I heard a man boast this afternoon on the radio to come to his place because they were going to bring in equipment from Pennsylvania and Ohio to, to serve the Lord with. Equipment? What equipment do you need to serve the Lord with, brother? Why, the dear old camp meeting ladies used to say, Gee, this is my heart of harp of ten strings. She said, this is my heart with ten strings, and I praise the Lord, and the old wrinkled hands with brown spots, you know, on them, and they clap their little old wrinkled hands with shining faces. So, Harper, what do you need? What clap clap do you need? Do you need a bushel back of that basket full of guff to, to serve the Lord with, brother? If you have two knees, and even if you're stiff enough with arthritis so you can't get on your knees, you can look up in your heart, for prayer isn't getting on your knees. Prayer is the elevation of the heart to God. That's all a man needs. You can pray in a prison. You can pray on an airplane, and I do, and you can pray in a ship. You can pray anywhere, and you can worship God, because himself, it's himself that we want. Himself, love sits on his eyelids and scatters delight. So all the wide regions above, and their faces, the cherubims, veil in his sight and tremble with raptures of love. Now, the only kind of revival that I'm even remotely interested in is the kind of revival that will cause people to tremble with rapture in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all. Now, I'm nearly through. But I'd like to say this to you. I've been reading the Proverbs um, devotionally every day, and I've gotten into the 13th chapter, and I rather smiled when I read one of the Proverbs there. I don't remember how it runs in, in, in uh, King James, but I have it in two other translations here. Uh, one of them says, every sluggard is employed in wishing. That's the Septuagint version, the old Greek. 
version translated in English, every sluggard is employed in wishing. And the Knox translation says, idleness will and will not both at once. Now there we have a lot of Christians. They're sluggards. And being a, a, a lifelong student, I wouldn't take that word sluggard at its face value. I said, what's a sluggard? So I looked up, it up to find out what a sluggard was. Well, a slug is a sort of a streamlined snail. And uh, when they crawl along, they, they do about, uh, about a mile uh, a millennium. They just crawl along, leaving a wet streak behind them. That's a slug. And uh, a lazy slug. Some fellow looked at it, and then when his son wouldn't work, he said, you're like that slug, you're slug. And that's how we got the word in the English, a slug. And uh, the Bible says that uh, every sluggard is employed in wishing. Uh, goes to church, chases from one part of the city to the other, to hear a new evangelist, hoping that he can become a spiritual man, but he's too lazy. He's a slug. He will and he will not, both at the same time, it says. Now, that, that's the way Christ, a lot of Christians are. And what are you going to do with him? Dear God, do I have to wake him up? I can't. I've set up every alarm clock I could wind up and print in public, and I just can't wake people up. Sluggards will be sluggard till the Lord comes, I suppose. But I think some of you here are going to get some wings and get rid of the shell. I tell you this, that if some of you women kept house like you keep your soul, you'd be in for a divorce. Your wife, your husband wouldn't stay around. And if some of you men kept your business the way you keep your soul, your wife couldn't, uh, couldn't, couldn't live because you, you'd go bankrupt. What's your response? Well, in closing in seven minutes, the old brother says this, and I found it true. He said, now, in the, I'll paraphrase him and then read. He says, uh, if you're going to go on now and know God, get up and stir yourself and lift your heart to God and put away things and desire for property and things and seek himself alone and let him work in you without any rival. Well, he says, all the things will be true when thou doest this. And they will try to defeat thee in all that they can do. You won't get up to the corner with what some things will be after you. So if you want security, don't seek God. If you want security, the devil will give it to you for a while and then send you to hell. If you're afraid of things and all the rest, don't try to seek God. But he says this, and I like it. He says, let not. Therefore, the cavil therein till thou feel lift. Now I'll explain that. I don't want to be boring. But let not means don't you don't be hindered. Don't let anybody hinder you in your seeking after God. But travel therein until you feel desire. Who are the practical men? These old saints. They claim they were dreamers. They weren't dreamers. They were practical men. He said, when you first start out to seek a new height. To become something other than a common Christian, he said, the first thing you'll find the devil facing you to stop you. And he said, I exhort you now, don't stop because of that, but press right on whether you feel like it or not. And there are two times to pray when you feel like it and when you don't. And some want to be emotionally lifted and wafted into the sky, but the old saints knew better than that. Now, they knew that there are times when you've got to, by what he calls a naked intent under God. I want you to take that. A naked intent under God, he says. Now, that's what we need, brethren, is this naked intent to know God, to know Christ, to put the world beneath our feet, to put things beneath our feet, to put people beneath our feet, to, to open our hearts to only one lover, and that the Son of God himself. And keep everything else out of us. And from there on we mount and go up. I said I don't think anybody was ever filled with the Holy Ghost who didn't go through a time of awful darkness. And what he called the cloud of unknowing, the shadowy cloud where you couldn't seem to get through. But you believed God and you trusted Christ. And whether you felt like it or not, you went on. And you believed and you obeyed and you prayed when you felt like it and you prayed when you didn't. 
and you obeyed and you did what you should and you straightened things out and you got adjusted in your business and you got adjusted in your home and you got adjusted in your relationship and you quit wrong things and you gave up things that have been hindering you whether you felt like it or not. He says it's all a naked intent under God. Here's the strangest thing. If you talk about mysticism in the day in which we live, every fundamentalist throws his hands high in the air as though you were invoking the the spirit of uh, of uh, old Stalin. And you say, well, they're dreamers. They believe in emotion and feeling. Every one of them that I'm acquainted with talk. You've got to believe God by a naked, cold intent of your will. And then the other things follow along. Most unusual thing. I got a letter this week from the Reformed Church asking me to write a review of the book on mysticism. You can get mixed up any worse than that, I don't know how. But uh, they wanted me to they wanted me to review a book on mysticism that had been written by Dean Ng years ago. Mysticism, is it possible that we find a hard, cold, square doctrine, theology are not enough? Is it possible that people everywhere are speaking something better? Yes, it's possible, altogether it's possible, more than it's possible. But remember, thou feelest in thy will only a naked intent unto God. Have you got that tonight? Naked intent unto God. It brings the cross into your life. You're going to be that kind of Christian. And you're not going to let anybody stop in or fool you. And you're going to keep right on. And if you don't feel like it, you're going to believe anyway. And you're going to pray right on through with a cold, naked intent unto God believing the truth. Oh, I have this to tell you. God will out of your stony grief, he'll raise a devil. Out of the tomb, he'll lift you into the sky. Out of the darkness, he'll lift you into the light. Old Moody went down to here and lay on his little tummy on the floor in the kitchen on the stand of his mother cooked home and prayed that he might be baptized with the Holy Ghost for God nowhere. And then went out from there to the city and east. When the blessed Holy Ghost fell on him, he cried, Oh, God, stay thy hand or I'll die. Up out of his stony grief, God raised him. It's always so. But the chief saintless and the undersized pygmy Christian they won't be happy unless they can be happy. They just won't. They just demand it. I wouldn't put it past some of our so-called evangelical leaders to send for perfume feathers to tickle the chins of the saints to make them happy, to make them laugh. They'll do anything in the world to make people temporarily tickled except preach Jesus and himself. But if we get himself, we'll get all the joy and delight and all the rest with it. I'm a hard man in some ways, but there are times when the joy of the Lord lifts my heart very, very high. There are times when I sit down here looking as if I was dead, I suppose. They say I do. Colorless and unemotional, but in my heart there, there, there's such a joyous look toward God that I could scream out. My joy. Well, my friends, what about it? Day 30 and I'm going to quit. Do you want what I'm talking about? Do you want to move on past the low level of the common Christian? Do you want to know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, and the excellency of his knowledge? The increasing flights of spiritual elevation. You do. I've taken you a little further tonight, and I think you do, or you wouldn't be here. Now, let us pray. Now, before I pray, I want again tonight 
to know who wants me to pray for. Uh, you're a little puzzled. You're even a little upset. The neat little step-by-step, uh, step, tucked-up uh, formula that you have uh, been traveling on is sort of bothered tonight by this kind of preaching, and you're wondering whether you ever want to come back, whether I'm a little lost in a beam or just what. But in your heart of hearts, there's just one thing you can recognize, and that is a cry, Oh, God, I want thyself. I want thyself. I want the self isha isha. I want to know a husband in my heart. I want to know what the old prophet and what the Holy Ghost meant when he said, Thou shalt call me no more, Lord, thou shalt call me Ishai, for I will be a husband unto you. You want to know the internal husband, the, 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 the spiritual bridegroom of your heart. That you do know. You don't, you're not so sure about all the doctrines, but there's one thing your heart cries after, Oh, my God, that's what I want. And I want to pray for you. And if I pray for you, now remember this. I'm going to pray that God will be as rough as he has to be. And will be as hard on you as he needs to be. That he might bring you through out of this fleshly morass in which Christianity is wallowing now. Up the sunlit highlands. And it may be tough on you. Maybe some of you'll have to go back and write a letter home and straighten out things. Maybe some of you'll have to pay up where you didn't pay. Maybe some of you'll have to quit certain things that you've been very close to. But anyway, you're going to put everything under your feet and say, Oh, that's what I want, Brother Tozer, that I may know him, and I don't care what it costs. Pray for me. Who raise your hand? God bless you, sir, and you. You, who else? Put the hand up, yes, I see you. And you, yes, who else? Put the hand up. Yes, sir, I see your hand right there. And you, sir. Oh, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. How most we live in a world where Perils and dangers are on every hand. And life is short and time is fleeting and judgment is coming. And Satan is busy. And all the fiends are squaring themselves across the path for trying to prevent us from going ahead. But we hear you calling from the mountain peak. And we want to know thee. And the power of thy resurrection and the fellowship of thy suffering and be made conformable unto thy death. And we want to know the beauty and wonder that is thee. And we pray for these who requested prayer. Oh, Christ Jesus, Christ Jesus, Christ Jesus, thou who didst come in olden times in the form of a dove, and sat upon him till them's fire. And thou who didst come to Peter and to the Moravians and to the saints of New England, thou who didst come, O Lord, in spots here and there, in Borneo and Korea, oh, withhold not thy glory from us. We cry, show us thy glory, Lord, show us thy glory. And teach us how to go on. Now grant we pray that this may be a good week. And if the devil makes it the worst week we've ever had, we'll understand it. We'll have a naked intent and determination. And we'll calmly, quietly believe. Even though we should be attacked. Even though the, the darkness should settle over us. We'll know it's the cloud of unknowing. It's the dark night of the soul that precedes the bright morning of the heart. And we won't be frightened. For we know thou didst go through the garden and through the cross and into the darkness and out of the darkness and into the tomb and out of the tomb and into the glory. So wilt thou lead thee and lead us and lead this church. And oh, we pray, bring us to a place where soon we may be under grace, spiritually prepared for a mighty outpouring of the Holy Ghost. 
an outpouring that shall bring in reality that which everybody's talking about and nobody has. And we shall come back to New Testament spirituality, back to Book of Acts, Christianity again. Maybe out from us here there shall flow streams into the desert way and fire that shall touch churches and groups everywhere. Bless us as we wait. And above all things, show us thyself, thyself, Lord, and show us thy glory. Hide us in the rock as thou passest by, and show us thy glory, so that all the glory of this world shall appear as ashes after that wondrous sight. This we ask in the holy name of Jesus. Now, as we close, I'm going to ask Brother Ray to sing as a little solo for us.